Good morning. Everybody doing okay? God, got some applause over here before I even asked how you guys were doing. That's, that's wonderful. Um, good morning. Glad you guys are here. So, been working through the book of Ephesians. If you're new here, we go through whole books of the Bible. We go through them word for word, line by line. You know, it's amazing. I don't, I don't, know, um, I don't know if you talk to other people. Christians in other parts of the country or world, but uh, it's, it's shocking how few churches teach the Bible anymore. And um, I don't mean that condescendingly towards other churches. I, I just, I, I find it fascinating. I learned a long time ago that I'm just not good enough to come up with stuff on my own. So I just read the Bible and expound on it because, I mean, it's, it's a perfect book. It's given to us by God. It just makes sense. So if you're new here, that, that's all we do. We do nothing groundbreaking at this church. At least I don't do anything groundbreaking at this church. I just read what the Word says and, and, and maybe give you a little context and add a little bit of uh, maybe application to it, but that's all we do. We happen to be working through a book in the New Testament. It's a shorter book. It's a letter. Most of the New Testament are letters written to different churches, written from a guy named Paul to uh, a series of churches, a group of churches in Western Turkey. The Bible calls that area Asia Minor, but in Western Turkey. And so this letter was written because some, some bad theology, some bad teaching, some bad philosophy had kind of infiltrated the church a little bit. And this is about 30 years after Jesus was resurrected, death, burial, and resurrection. This is about 60 to 62 AD, somewhere in that ballpark when Paul wrote this from a prison in Rome because he was concerned about the church in this particular area. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about this. I always like giving a little bit of historical context and geographical context because I'm kind of nerdy like that. And this was a very affluent, um, very educated, uh, very diverse, and also very, very pagan area. And, and the majority of the Christians that Paul were, were writing to were not Jewish Christians. So they had very little history when it came to knowledge of the true God, knowledge of who Jesus is. So they're kind of infants, if you will, in their spiritual walk, a lot of them. So Paul was kind of protective over them. What we talked about last week, we did chapter one, if you weren't here. And um, what we talked about, two different things, was one is I think as Christians, we can easily forget the magnitude of the fact that we can know God. Not only is it a big deal that we can know God, uh, but that we can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And I think it's very easy, especially in our day and age where there's so many distractions, it's very easy for us to grow complacent or apathetic, and we forget, I get to talk to God. I have a relationship with God. God sent his son to die so I could be forgiven of the evil I have done. And we, and we forget that sometimes. And we need to be reminded of that. And so if we, we do know this, if we are cognizant of the fact that God loves us, has a relationship with us, has sacrificed for us, that should shape us into being better people. Talked about this last week, and we'll talk about it a little bit today. It is impossible to have a relationship with God and remain the same. So whenever people say, well, I'm a Christian, but if you're still living in the same things, we're going to talk about that today. If you're still living in the same things you were, you were doing before you knew Jesus, some, something is amiss. Something is wrong, okay? Today, we're gonna talk about this. In, in chapter two of, of Ephesians is very, very famous. There's some huge theological things in chapter two, uh, uh, particularly verse eight and nine, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit today, uh, but that's not where we're gonna hang out forever. There's this little nugget, pretty proud of myself for this, that I found towards the end of this chapter and we're gonna talk about two things, that, that Jesus has to be two things in our life. He has to be the foundation in our life, the bottom of our life, and Jesus also has to be the authority in our life. He, that's why the Bible says that he is the beginning and the end, right, the alpha, the omega. He has to be on both sides. He has to be the foundation, and he also has to be the authority, and we will talk about that a little bit today, and I'll show you why once we get to the end, why we're going to talk about it. That's a happy first slide, isn't it? It's October, it's close to Halloween. Um, I was talking last night, um, as, a, as a Christian who is getting older and has children, it's hard to find good Halloween movies. And so some of you older cats in the room, I have watched the new Munsters movie on Netflix twice because it's completely clean. Anyone else watch the Munsters as a kid besides me? All right, go. okay, good. If you did, it's fantastic. And um, it's really good. It's really true to the old show. It's very campy and goofy and weird and 
There's this wonderful scene where Herman Munster and, and his wife are having drinks with the creature from the Black Lagoon. That's just funny, right? That's just good. All right. You should have got a note sent out when you walked in. Everything will be in there. That's the only thing you're going to take from this whole sermon today. Something about the Black Lagoon and drinks. Um, so anyways, there are notes, handouts you should have got when you walked in. Everything will be on the screens. If you have the Experience Community app, click on Sermon Notes. Everything is right there. We're in the New Testament, right after the book of Galatians. You have the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to pray, and I'll read a little bit, and we'll, we'll blast through chapter 2 uh, relatively quickly. Okay? All right, let me pray. Father, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much, Lord, um, that we have the opportunity to come in this morning to, to worship you freely, to, to open up the word of God and to read that and study that freely. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that, that as we study today that you bless this church, and we pray that you bless all of our campuses and not just our churches, God. We pray that you bless every church in this community and every church in the other communities that, we, that we're in, God. Lord, we pray for the great nonprofits we work with, God. Uh, and ultimately, Lord, we pray that everything we do today, that, that it doesn't honor us, but that it honors you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. Keep your hand on us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to have fun with this. You're going to have an absolute blast this morning. I'm going to read a little bit. We'll go back and we'll break it down, okay? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked, according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. Starts off a little bleak. Chapter one, we talked about forgiveness and we talked about redemption. In chapter two, Paul tells us why forgiveness and redemption are so important. It's because you were dead. Not literally dead, spiritually dead, but you were on a pathway, you and I were on a pathway to eternal death. That is hell, separation from God. We were dead because of our trespasses and our sins. Now, these are two words that we use in church, but we don't often define them. I'd say in the modern church, we don't even acknowledge sin as much as we should, but the Bible talks about it quite a bit. A sin is anything we do that violates the commands of God. So there are certain sins of omission, things that, that if we do not do them, it's a sin. There are certain sins called sins of commission, which are things that God says don't do, and then we do them. And so um, when we do these things, it is a violation to God's commands, and we should ask for God's forgiveness. Sins are, are, are actions, one-time actions. Trespasses are when we reach a point to where we have told ourselves that it's okay to do this sin repetitively. That's our trespasses. That is a lifestyle of violating God's commands. This may make sense to you, this may not make sense to you, but this is how I describe this. It is one thing to tell a lie, it is another thing to be a liar. There may be a time under stress or under pressure or under fear or something like that where you may tell a lie, and you are to repent for that. It is another thing to, to, to convince yourself that it's okay to lie to people, that that's just not a big deal. That is a trespass, and that is why we are dead uh, uh, in our, our, our spirit is because we are living in this violation of God. But I love what Paul says here. Paul says that's how you used to live. That's how you previously walked. When we become Christians, we're choosing to not walk the way that we want to walk or the way that the world walks or the way that the devil wants us to walk. We are choosing to walk the way Jesus wants us to walk by his principles, his teachings. And so accepting Jesus is not only a spiritual decision, it is a mental decision, and that should be evident in everything that we do. So to claim Jesus Christ, but to not have evidence of claiming Jesus Christ is nowhere supported in the Bible. And so often in church, we say, I know Jesus. Okay, do you live like you know Jesus? There should be evidence of that fruit. There should be proof, if you will, that you have a relationship 
with Jesus Christ. And if there is no evidence, there's a problem. And if you think I'm just pulling that out of thin air, you just need to go back and read the book of Matthew and the book of John. So many different uh, agricultural references that Jesus makes where if something doesn't produce fruit, we cut it off and we throw it into a fire. That's in John 15, right? All throughout the book of Matthew, all the different allusions to vineyards and fig trees and all these kinds of things that we are to be producing the fruit of a relationship with Jesus. If we're in disobedience to Jesus, I beg my pardon for a second. I'm gonna talk spiritual things in church this morning. If we are disobedient to Jesus, we are following the desires of the devil, this is, there, there are only two forces in the universe, good and evil, God and Satan. These are the only two forces. There is no neutral, there is no in-between. We're either going this direction or going that direction. So we as individuals, when we are disobedient to the teachings of God, we are living under the influence of the ruler of the power of the air, that is Satan. When we as a society are living in disobedience, we as a society are living under the influence of Satan. Corey, that just sounds really extreme. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the United States. What we have done in the United States, we claim to be one nation under God, which is true, but it's not this God. It's the God of the individual. And this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. If you've never read Genesis chapter 3, it's in the beginning of your Bible, the Genesis of your Bible. If you go way back to the beginning, and the devil's temptation and, and how the devil approached Eve is Satan didn't walk up and be like, hey, Eve, I'm a lot cooler than God. Worship me. That's not what he did. Satan walked up to Eve and he said, hey, can you eat any fruit in this garden? And she says, well, we can eat anything except for that tree. And he says, well, why can't you eat from that tree? Because God told us to. And Satan goes, did he really tell you that? You can eat from that. And guess what? If you eat from it, you will be like God. This is the temptation that the United States has bought into. The devil doesn't want us to worship him. The devil just wants us to worship ourselves. And when we worship ourselves, we will end up just as damned as if we worshiped the devil outright. And that is the prevailing God of our culture right now is the worship of self. We are under the influence of the power, uh, uh, we're under the ruler of the power of the air, which is the devil. And when we align ourselves with anything other than Jesus Christ, there are consequences to that. This is why Paul said that when we lived in disobedience, we were children under wrath. Again, things that the North American church does not want to talk about, that there are consequences. No one in the United States thinks there are consequences for anything, but unfortunately, there are consequences for our disobedience and our actions. We live as children under wrath in a couple of different ways. One, there are natural cause and effect consequences to sin. We're gonna talk like adults this morning. If you have promiscuous sex, the reason why the Bible says one man, one woman exclusively for life is because there are biological consequences if we just have sex with everyone around us. You can get STDs, right? Some of them fatal. You can have unwanted pregnancies. There, there are psychological effects of promiscuous sex with multiple partners, all of these different things. And God wants something better for you than that. But there are natural consequences. If you break the Ten Commandments, like stealing or murdering people, you will be arrested and you will be thrown in jail. Those are natural consequences to our actions. We will experience hatred both internally and towards us if we live in sin. There are natural consequences that relationships are broken, awful things are said about us, and we say awful things. These are just natural cause and effect, logical uh, ramifications of sin. There are also times when God intentionally does something to us because of the sin we are living in. Most likely in the Bible to get our attention and to turn us away from that sin and to get us to repent and come to him because he loves us. But sometimes God actually inflicts things on us because of our sin. And then the last thing is, is one day every single one of us will stand in front of Jesus Christ, the great judge, and will be eternally judged. There will be eternal consequences for how we have lived this life, whether in obedience to him or disobedience. You know, look, we're talking about logic again here. And when you say things about like, like hell, that there is a hell, there is eternal damnation, people get so offended. How could a loving God do this? I'm gonna tell you how a loving God can do this. I'm gonna answer this for all of you. 
How we live our lives determines where we go for eternity. What we say, if we live in in disobedience to God our entire life, we are saying to God, I don't want to be with you. When we live in obedience to God, we're saying, I want to be with you forever. So at the end of our life, God just gives us what we have always wanted. You have wanted to be with me, you're with me. You have said your entire life, you don't want to be with me. I'm going to honor that, and I'm going to eternally separate separate you from me. He gives us exactly what we have wanted in this life. That is logical, it is fair, right? I would say it's actually not fair, because none of us have earned heaven, but God gives us what we've already asked for. Okay, so the first three verses are are pretty dark. It's all better from from here on out. That's why I put this flower up here. It's all gonna be okay. (laughs) The next two words are important, okay? He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in this coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. These next three verses are very important. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. There's a lot there. Okay, like I said, verse one through three are, are, are pretty depressing. It's pretty sad. A lot of stuff about death, a lot of stuff about wrath, a lot of stuff about consequences. But Paul reminds us, because of God's grace and mercy, you don't have to remain spiritually dead. We have an out, right? Because Jesus Christ conquered death through the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross that now we can live spiritually alive. So God not only loves us, God extends mercy to us. Our sins separated us from God. They made us spiritually dead. They made us hopeless. But now when we lean into the cross, when we accept Christ, we have life, we have hope. Not only that, it says that one day we will be raised up and seated with him. So the power of the Holy Spirit given to us because of Jesus' work not only gives us hope and fulfillment in this life, It also gives us the promise of an eternal reward that is heaven, that is being with him. And if you've never read the book of Revelation, if you go back, I I haven't taught it in about four years. I taught it in 2018. I love teaching the book of Revelation, which sounds a little weird too, but towards the end, it is absolutely beautiful. And in Revelation chapter 19, you get this imagery of this huge banquet where all evil has been dealt with and we are sitting with Jesus Christ and we are eating and we are drinking and we are laughing and we are celebrating because we're about to have an eternity with him. This is the kind of language that Paul is talking about, that we will inherit this eternal reward to get to be with Christ forever. So because of our salvation, we're not only alive in Christ, we're empowered to live in such a way to where we can actually battle evil in this life. Something we don't talk about enough in church, right, is we don't talk about the power of God. The fact that we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into the world to make a difference. This is why the Bible says there are a lot of people that have an appearance of godliness, but they deny the power. We need to make sure that we don't just say we're Christians, but that we live in the power of God that he has given us. And so quite frankly, there are too many people who are living like they're still dead. Too many people who claim to be Christians, but but they do not believe, they don't tap into the power that God has for them. There are too many Christians who still live addicted and who still live slaves to their lust and their flesh and their desires. That's not what you're designed to be. There are too many Christians who don't show love. They're, They're mean, they're hopeless. And we can demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. We can display those things. We can be set free, not just from physical addictions, but from, from mental addictions, from insecurities. And we can go out and set the example to the world of what real love is. Not the bastardized, twisted love that America tries to sell you. We throw around the word love so haphazardly. Love is love. What does that mean? Are you simply telling me that I have to accept everything you do and that is the highest expression of love? That is reckless and careless. If you're harming yourself, if you're cutting yourself, if you're doing things that are destructive and you want me to accept that, I can't because I love you. That, hold on, that's why Jesus said, I discipline you because I love you. I tell you that certain things are wrong because I love you. And we need to go out into the world and, 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 and intensely love people, not by the, the shallow standard of the world, but by the deep, impactful standard of God. And we can do that because we have a loving God that resides in us to be alive. And then we reach these pivotal passages, verses 8 and 9. These are some of the most theologically important passages in the entire Bible. The word is clear. The Bible is clear. We are saved by grace through faith. There is absolutely nothing we can do to earn salvation. There is absolutely nothing we can do to earn the love of God. It is a free gift because God knows if we could earn it, we would be arrogant about it. God knows that. So he gives it to us for free. So we have to humble ourselves. We have to know as individuals and as a people that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot earn the love of God. It's free. Now, if we're talking real in here, and I'm going to be careful because the Sunday morning services are recorded, but I don't know if anyone else in here doesn't have a relationship with a parental figure. I haven't had a relationship with my father in many, many years. And listen, before anyone sends me an email and, man, I'm just one day, you guys are going to be besties again. I'm okay with it. He actually doesn't need to be around my family. There needs to be some distance. He's, he's not the best man. So anyways, um, because I had those, those scars from a, a dysfunctional childhood and, and, and a father that, that never gave me affirmation or anything like that, what we have a tendency to do, we're talking real, maybe someone else will be honest in here this morning besides me, what we have a tendency to do because of the scars of life is we can take these issues with our, our earthly relationships and we can apply them to our heavenly relationship with God. I don't know if anyone else in here feels like they have to prove themselves to God besides me. I, I, I have to be, I, I find myself almost being performance-based. God, that's good, right? And the word tells me that God's looking down at me saying, Corey, there's nothing you can do to make me love you anymore. Just accept this love. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation, Corey. Just Live in my love. Live in this salvation. And maybe someone else in this room needed to hear that, or maybe I'm the only one. But sometimes we apply those scars of life to our Heavenly Father, and He's perfect. He's good, and He's perfect, and He's gracious. And we need to know that. Now, what we tend to do in the United States is because we say, we, 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 we read the scripture that says, well, it's free. I cannot earn salvation, so I'm going to live irresponsibly, and the Bible does not condone that either. That's why we have to keep on reading the passage. So a lot of people stop at 8 and 9, but then you need to read verse 10. So though salvation is a gift, that gift is received by our faith. So we do have some responsibility in this. It's like if I give you a brand new car, right? We walk out in the parking lot. Hey, look, I just bought you this brand new car. Here are the keys. If, if though I've given you or I've offered you this brand new car, if you never take the initiative to stick the key in the ignition and turn it on, the car goes nowhere. The car is of no good. It's the same thing with the gracious gift of salvation. God says, I've bought it. I've paid for it. Here's faith. Just put it in the ignition and this thing will get moving. But we have to take the initiative to have faith. And faith should be evident in how we live. So, Though how much we pray, how much we read the Bible, how much we study, even how much we live out the commands of God, though those things cannot save our soul, those demonstrations of faith should be evident in our life. If we are saved, goes back to what I said earlier, there should be evidence of that salvation. So 
That leads to the next point. It's clear that we're not saved by works, but verse 10 says we are created for good works. In the book of James, it says that works without, or faith without works is dead. So we're not saved by our works, but we are not saved from our works either. We are the workmanship of God created to go out and do something. You are not saved just to sit back and become a fat Christian. I'm not talking about your, because, I mean, because I'm getting there as well, guys. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about entitlement. It's not just about your blessings. It's not just about your get out of hell free card. We have a mission. We are the workmanship of God to be saved, not just to sit around and, and just consume all the time. That is not biblical. That we are called to go out and, and not only live holy, which means you are saved to build a relationship with God. Pray, read the word of God, apply the word of God, not just that. We are to go out and live the word of God, which means we become an assault and light to a world that is dark and tasteless. We don't come to church just so we can avoid damnation. We come to church because we have a mission. We are the workmanship of God. And there are too many Christians in the United States who are like, I ain't going to hell. That's great. What about your neighbor? What about your family? What about your children? What about your school? What about your work? What about the government? My God, right? What about it? And all of our complaining and sitting around with our arms crossed, well, I know Jesus. Well, get out and tell someone else about Jesus. Stop complaining about the world and go be the light of the world like God told you to be in Matthew chapter five. All right, I'm sorry. I've been angry all weekend, guys. We're on the last part. We're almost done. <laughs> Hooray, anger. All right, let's, let's read this last Let's read this last part. <laughs> Man. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law of consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and the peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. So what the heck is going on here? So what Paul is talking about is the Jewish Christians in Ephesus and the Greek and Roman Christians in Ephesus were not getting along. And that was mostly because the Jewish Christians were looking down on the non-Jewish Christians. So if you read the Bible, there are really only two people in the world according to the Bible, Jews and everyone else. And so the everyone else kind of came on to the scene later. We is non-Jews, and I'm sure there are some Jews in this congregation by blood, but, but the, the Jews were kind of the original branch, if you will, or the original uh, tree. And we were grafted into that because of Jesus. What the Jewish Christians were doing, though, is they were looking down at the non-Jewish ones because they didn't have the history that they had. They didn't have the, the pedigree. They didn't know um, about all the commands of God thousands of years prior. They didn't know about the prophecies about the Messiah. So they kind of looked down on them. 
One of the other reasons why they looked down on them is the Jewish men had been circumcised, which if you go back and read in the Old Testament, that was a physical representation of a promise that God had made with the Jewish people. And the Gentiles, they didn't think, had that promise. What had happened, though, again, was because of Jesus, we are grafted into the promise that was made to the Jews. What Paul is saying here to the Jewish Christians is there's a problem with your heart. You think it's all about, about how you look on the outside by your customs, by your traditions. And Paul says there's, it's not about a circumcision of the body anymore. Paul says it's a circumcision of the heart. It's a heart change. So though they had history, though they had pedigree, they were not living out the principles of God to the people around them. Though they were a nation built on God, though they had access to all the knowledge of God, they were not loving people in society the way that they were supposed to be loving them. Everyone with me? We are a nation that was started on the principles of God we have had more access to the word of God than any other people in the world, and we may be some of the most vile people on planet Earth right now. If we're just gonna be honest, guys, look at the hostility in the United States. Look at how mean we are. And, and let's take it internally. Let's, let's not just focus on people out there. How often have we worn the T-shirt or gotten the tattoo, if you don't think that's a sin, put the sticker on the car, all these different things, and then treat our waitress like garbage? How often have we done it? How often have we been guilty? We're in the Bible Belt, right? And, and everyone assumes that once you come to the Bible Belt, everyone's just nice and kind. Well, a lot of times they are to your face and they gossip about you in the prayer meeting later. How often do we, do we have a knowledge of Jesus but fail to live that out? But now the outsiders are part of the family. So Paul told the non-Jews that through the mercy and grace of God, they have been adopted into the family of God. There's no longer a wall. There's no longer a, a division. We all are inheritance. We are all recipients of the same promises that the Jews had before Jesus came onto the scene. We are grafted into that. So their history kind of becomes our history. So what that means, because the wall of hostility is gone, I hope that you, 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 you kind of ponder on this a little bit today. God not only wants peace vertically, not only does he want peace here, God wants peace uh, uh, horizontally. He wants peace this way as well. So we're not just to be at peace with God. We are to be at peace with each other. The Bible says as much as possible, we are to live at peace with everyone around us, that we are to be peacemakers, and that if anyone submits to Christ, they are our brother. They are our sister. We may disagree with the method. We may disagree with the style, but if they agree with this book, right, we are brothers and sisters. You may not even like to be around them a whole lot, but they are still family in God. And we all have access to salvation in God because of the Trinity. If you, if you haven't, if you don't know what that means, God is one God represented in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And all three parts of God work in our salvation. God came up with the plan, God the Father, the Son carries out the plan, and the Spirit empowers us to live out the plan until Jesus comes back for us. So all of God is working in our lives. And so Paul moves on to this metaphor about a building. He says to the Jewish Christians and to the non-Jewish Christians, you guys are all bricks in a temple, a building that God is building. And so what I think of is there was the very different cultures. How they worshiped Jesus in Israel looked dramatically different than how they worshiped Jesus in Turkey or in Rome in different areas, right? Because of culture. And that's okay, if you go to uh, uh, Jinja, Uganda, they worship God very, very differently. Same Bible, they believe in the same things, but it looks very different over there. If you go down the street, my, my good buddy, uh, Chris Finley, Father Finley at St. Patrick's Anglican Church, it looks very different than it does here. We believe in the same things, we love the same God, we're working towards the same goal, but the method is different, and that's okay. As long as we agree theologically, the method will always change. You know, people go to different churches and they're like, T-shirt, loud music, oh, this is blasphemous. Nope, not according to this, right? Things change. 50 years ago, they didn't have LED panels where you could show PowerPoints. Like, there's nothing sacrilegious about that. It's a method, and the method always changes. We just need to make sure that the theology does not change. 
Because God was the same yesterday, today, forever. This does not change. And right now we live in an American Christianity that says, well, because of culture, we're going to remove 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pull that out. A little offensive. We're going to pull out Romans chapter 1. A little offensive, right? We're going to pull out this stuff here, and we cannot do that. And if you want to know why we cannot do that, just flip to the very back of your Bible and read the end of Revelation. That if anyone takes anything out or adds anything in, it's going to be bad news. Hey, fun fact, because I've been really heavy this morning. If you ever go to St. Patrick's Anglican Church, if you ever just want to become an Anglican, if you go into their foyer, uh, there's a picture of me in their foyer. Isn't that fun? So even if you do become an Anglican, you'll never escape me. I will always be there. I'll always be watching. So, <laughs> that's going to be my new goal, is I want a picture of me in, in every foyer of every church in Murfreesboro, just to creep people out a little bit. So the other thing that Paul says, and I I find this really remarkable, he says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the disciples and of the prophets of the Old and New Testament. And in this, we are the bricks, the prophets and the disciples are, are, are kind of the foundation, but the cornerstone is Jesus. The thing that holds everything up is Jesus. Now, Paul is alluding to two different scriptures. And the scriptures he are alluding to actually uses two different versions of cornerstone. One is a foundation that holds everything up. The other is called a capstone or a keystone, which holds everything together from the top. It is the authority. It completes everything. And so what Paul is saying is Jesus is both the foundation and Jesus is also the authority. The capstone. And this brings us back to Revelation 22, verse 13. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? This is where Jesus says this. And then how he ends is Paul is talking to the the non-Jewish Christians who were probably pouting a little bit because they were getting picked on. Get this. The non-Jewish Christians had got hurt in church by other Christians, and now they're, they're victims. They're upset. They're upset. And Paul says this. Listen. I've already told you that under Jesus Christ, you have equality, you have grace, you have love, you have empowerment, and a victim mindset and Christianity are incompatible. But Corey, you don't know how bad I got hurt. I don't. God does, though, and his spirit is bigger than your hurt. Well, Corey, I got hurt in a church one time. You haven't been to next class because I tell my story about getting hurt in a church in next class. I got hurt really, I got excommunicated from a church, my wife and I, right? Completely blackballed from a whole denomination. You can come to next class and you can hear that story. That doesn't mean that I gave up on church. If you give up on humans every single time you get let down, you need to go buy some land in Wyoming, right? You need to get some solar panels, live off the grid, and never see another person again. Because every single human is going to fail you in some way. That's why we don't put our trust in humans. That's why we put our trust in God. If you give up on restaurants every time that you have a bad service, right? You're never going to eat again. But people will get hurt one time in church. They're like, I'm done. I'm done. Man, guys, we need to toughen up a little bit. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we can overcome not only hurts that have happened to us. Well, Corey, you don't know my upbringing. You don't know my upbringing all the way. But I do know that the Holy Spirit is bigger. I know that the Holy Spirit is restorative. I know that the Holy Spirit has power to overcome anything that is in our lives. So the Christian needs to stop using excuses. They need to put on their big boy pants, big girl pants, and we need to let the Holy Spirit change our lives. And we need to be empowered by that. So Paul says this in the book of Romans. The wages of sin is death. Sometimes that means literally death, right? My wife and I had a friend in college. We went to high school with him as well. Got wasted one night at a party, got on I-24 doing 120 miles per hour in the wrong direction. Hit an embankment, died instantly. I I loved him. I was good friends with him. I was at his funeral, helped put his casket in the ground. The wages of sin sometimes is literally death. It is literally death. The wages of sin is death, though, can also mean spiritually that we are alive physically, but we are dead internally. So do we understand that our disobedience to God's commands has natural and temporary consequences, and it has spiritual and eternal consequences? Do we really understand it? Do we really understand it? 
If we really understand that, we would address our sin. We would address the sin in our lives. We would feel remorse for the sin in our lives. If we truly love God, I'm not even talking about your salvation being in question, but if we do something in disobedience to the one that we claim to love the most, that should, that should, that should cause remorse in us. And we have created a Christian culture to where we have justified disobedience to God. And according to the Bible, disobedience to God is following the ruler of the air, that is the devil. And whenever Christians start making excuses for following the devil, something has gone really off the rails. Have we asked for Jesus to forgive us? Have we asked for Jesus to help us, right? To deliver us, to put people in our life that will hold us accountable. Have we addressed our sin? If we do not address our sin, we will continue to live in spiritual death. But because God loves us, he shows us mercy. He gives us the opportunity to have life, to have hope. How? By having a relationship with Jesus. Salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. We can't earn it. We can't earn a relationship with God, but we receive it by having genuine faith. That's not just acknowledging that God exists. I say this virtually every weekend. It says in James that every devil in hell knows that God exists. That is not saving faith. Saving faith is believing and living like I believe. Living like I, I, I know that these words are true. That there are ramifications for disobedience. So we have salvation by grace, but we have to take the key of faith and turn it on, right? We have a certain amount of responsibility. And when we have a relationship with Jesus, if you don't have one yet, I'm just going to tell you, when you open up that door and Jesus becomes a part of your life, he becomes a part of every corner of your life. Jesus gets all up in your business. He gets in your marriage. He gets in how you raise your children. He gets, your attitude, gets into your attitude at work. He gets into your bank account. He gets into everything. And that's fantastic. He changes it all for the better. That when we allow God access into every corner of our life, he makes every corner better. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper until we find ourselves being peaceful people, fulfilled people, content people. Because we've been saved, because we are being restored, because we are empowered. Why? Not to live in the same death that God delivered us from, but to live in life, to live honorably, to live righteously, to live in a way that glorifies God and blesses the people around us. We are not saved just to escape hell. Escape hell. We are saved for a purpose, for a mission. We have an objective. We have a job. So we have to be responsible. I don't care what the world around, I don't care what American culture tells you, you have to be responsible. God calls you to be responsible. And our initial responsibility is just to accept the gracious gift of forgiveness and salvation, to welcome Jesus in. I keep quoting the book of James, but it says in James that, that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Our, our responsibility in that is to open the door. Come in. And when we welcome Jesus in, like I said, he gets involved in everything in our life. We have to be responsible to get off the couch, right? To open up the door to invite Jesus into our lives. And when we start to fall in love with God, we are to be responsible for obeying the commands of God. John, right? Jesus says that. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. I love Jesus more than everything. Are you keeping his commands? Are you doing what the Bible tells you to do? Well, we all sin, Corey. No, 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 no. We're not talking about other people. You. Are you living in disobedience? Am I living in disobedience? And if we are consciously living in disobedience, by Jesus' definition, we don't love him. We don't love him. That's Jesus' definition. If you love me, you will do what I tell you to do. If you love me, you will live in obedience to me. So the only pathway to restoration we talked about that Jesus is bigger than our past. Jesus is bigger than our hurts. Jesus is bigger than our insecurities. Well, the only way to be restored, to be reconciled with God, to have peace, to have contentment, is we must make Jesus the foundation. How we do that is through the word of God. 
man, God is so good that he didn't, he didn't leave uh, uh, how we are to live ambiguous. He says, here you go. This is how you are to live. Live by these instructions. Here's the history, right? And here are the practical ways that we are to live. And that has to be the foundation of our life. Until this teaching, these principles, right? Jesus, through the word of God, until that is our foundation, we will never find restoration. We will never find peace. We will never find contentment. But not only does the word of God have to be our foundation, Jesus also have to, has to be our authority. Which means, regardless of how you feel, regardless of, of, of what your dreams are and your hopes are, regardless of any of those things, we have to submit to the authority of Jesus. There have been many times I have read the Bible and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't feel like that but I have to submit my feelings to Jesus. It doesn't matter how I feel. God is the authority in my life. He has to be the foundation and he has to be the authority. Logically and practically speaking, has any other way ever worked? Show me anywhere in human history that not making God the foundation and the authority, find me one instance in history where it has worked but we're in America, right? We're gonna get it right this time. That's how cocky we are in this country. It doesn't matter that the Romans fell, the Greeks fell, the Persians fell, the Assyrians fell, the Egyptians fell. We're Americans. And we're, gonna, and we're doing all the same thing that all those civilizations did. And we're tanking. But we're smarter than God, right? We're better than that. We're, we're more evolved than those very primitive people from the past. And we've learned Nothing. Nothing. Let's not even talk about society. Let's talk about you and I as individuals. How many times have we tried to do it our way only to end up driving off a cliff? How many times have we done it our way and only found out that they were bankrupt? Literally, emotionally, spiritually, that we're train wrecks. How many, how many relationships do we have to burn up, right? How much hopelessness do we have to endure how much anxiety do we have to live under? On and on and on it goes. It is until we, we willingly submit and make Jesus our foundation and our authority that we will find freedom, that we will find peace, that we will find hope, that we will find joy, that we will move forward, that we can have the hope of an eternity with God. Would you bow your heads with me, please?